Hi, good evening, welcome. I'm thrilled that you're joining us this evening for the second in our four-part lecture series this year entitled Sabbath and Jubilee, A Biblical Theology on Belonging. I would like to take a moment now to introduce to you our speakers this evening. Nikayla Reese is a sessional instructor here at Ambrose University. She teaches classes in Old Testament and Biblical Theology, and she also teaches New Testament at Alberta Bible College. Nikayla is also currently in her PhD program at Trinity College in England, where she is studying Isaiah's Sabbath text in the book of Acts. She is the lead pastor of a Baptist parish in Bonness, and we are thrilled that she is with us this evening. Also here is Reverend Rick Strangway. Rick came to our Ambrose faculty two years ago. Before that, he served with the Christian and Missionary Alliance for almost 30 years. Uh, he has two doctoral degrees, and they are in preaching and leadership, and one in New Testament. I know that you are going to find these next 60 minutes very enriching, as well as educating. Welcome, Rick and Nikayla. Thank you so much, Marva. Um, wow, I am really honored to be here, and uh, I've me been too. part of Ambrose for a long time, so this feels really special to me. I, I care about uh, this community a lot, and this is one of my favorite subjects, so yeah. I can't wait. Uh, should, we, should we just dive in? Let's go. Yeah, okay. you jump in. Okay. When I was a kid, <clears throat> um, I sort of uh, thought and, and was taught that Christianity, becoming being a Christian, was really about me and Jesus in my own personal, private, uh, mm -hmm. kind of inward relationship with Jesus. And I obviously, I, I still believe that's a part of it, for sure. Uh, but it's amazing to me how when I started going to Bible college, I, I'm an Ambrose alumni. <laughs> uh, when I went to Bible college here, I, I went to seminary here as well, and I began to learn more about the scripture. I saw that um, the Bible presents a vision that's way bigger yeah. than just me and yeah. Jesus. That's true. Uh, and, and I got so many students, um, and I, I get to have a lot of really beautiful one-on-ones with my students. And I, I, I meet people all the time that grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. They read their Bible, they pray, and they still talk a lot about um, loneliness mm -hmm. and uh, anxiety, fears about the future, fears about not belonging, not fitting in, not, not finding a place to call home, you know? Yeah. And, and I think, wow, I, the, the, the vision we see in scripture is about more than inward, an, an inward sort of private thing. Uh, and, and I was struck earlier this week, I've been reading an old uh, classic by Abraham Heschel, and there was a quote in there where he says, uh, the world needs more than the secret holiness of individual inwardness. And so as long as we keep imagining discipleship as being about just me and my own private relationship with Jesus, I think we're missing out yeah. on a lot of what the Bible is, uh, is, is revealing to us. Because I think in the Bible, um, there's one table, one table, not a million tables for two, one table, and all of us have a seat at it, and Jesus is there. And there's enough food for all of us. There's enough community. We don't put people who vote this way on this side of the table and people who vote that way, and then no, they don't have to talk. No, no. The vision is that we're all there, yeah. and we're not just there like, oh, boy, this is going to be rough. We're there at ease in community with each yeah. other, feeling safe around each other, and, and that's the table yeah. that I think our, our world needs, uh, <laughs> that table needs uh, to be set yeah. in our world. And so... <clears throat> I really think that the biblical vision of uh, God's dream for the world is more than secret holiness and inward spirituality. Uh, it's got to be a bigger, a bigger vision than that. So can I just geek out for a minute about yeah, the Old Testament? Do that. Like it's I want to do the whole Bible. Let's like, lay the base here. Yeah, this yeah. Be good. Yep. Um, I got to teach a course at Ambrose uh, last year called A Biblical Theology of Human Flourishing. And it's amazing how much time we had to spend in the Garden of Eden narrative <clears throat> to really kind of work through some of these uh, strange theologies we have about the individual spirituality, um, individual theology, sorry. So here's what I love. Okay, so um, spoiler alert, my wheelhouse is Sabbath. Uh, my master's thesis was Sabbath. My, the PhD I'm working on right now is about Sabbath, um, more the Old Testament Sabbath stuff in the New Testament. And so Sabbath, um, for anyone listening right now, they're probably thinking, oh yeah, like on the seventh day God rested. Uh, which is obviously an important part of Sabbath. But, but let me just unpack this for a second. Maybe this will be new for some people. I hope so. And then, you know, we could go for coffee or maybe they'll t t take human flourishing with me next year. <laughs> 
But uh, the biblical story begins in this garden. Uh, and the humans are naked and unashamed. They feel at home. They feel at ease. I, like, I think um, to, to be able to be that comfortable and that vulnerable with another person is, is truly a sense of feeling at home mm-hmm. with each other. Like, you obviously feel safe. This person's not judging you, scrutinizing you. You're not debating and arguing. Um, there's no, like, hierarchy over each other. There, there's just a sense of being at home. God's there, too. In Genesis 3, it says God is walking in the cool evening breeze. Like, God doesn't just come in and visit once a week, you know, the reservation <laughs> at the restaurant. Like, God lives there. This is God's home, too. God lives in Eden uh, with the humans. It's a place of rest. It's a place of abundance. There's enough food. There's enough water. Um, I think a biblical word that kind of captures this is shalom. Mm-hmm. And uh, on day seven, it says God rested. But I want people to think about that for a minute because it's not that God rested because he was tired. Like, you know, if like a long, uh, hard week at work, yeah. you just want to make a plate of nachos and just lay on the couch and watch football for an hour. Is that what you do yeah. when well, you rest? Maybe basketball. But I'm oh, basketball. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know anything about sports, <laughs> but I do like nachos. So okay, that's good. Um, that's good. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, like, like they kind of get this, you know, God's super tired and God just needed to take a rest. And I think we have that kind of weird, limited understanding of God resting. Mm-hmm. I feel like in English, it might be more accurate to say that God came to rest mm. instead of God took a rest. Like God's not just, I need a nap. I'm tired. I've worked all week. God came to rest. God came home. Like, have you ever done a really big reno? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. your house doesn't mm-hmm. feel like a home? It mm-hmm. just feels like this chaos zone and your blood pressure is really high the whole time. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, totally. like renos are super stressful. Yeah, they are. But then when they're finished, oh my God, you kind of sit back. You feel at ease. Yeah. That's yeah. rest. This is day seven. The work's done. Look at this garden. It's a big table. And all these creatures, all of creation is there. And God comes to rest. And there's something to that. And, and, and what happens um, when the humans uh, sin, they cover up. They put on clothes. They hide which shows that your nervous system is elevated, you no longer feel at ease. You're no longer resting. And so the book of Genesis begins in Eden, but it ends in Egypt. It's just this downward, we're hiding from each other, we're afraid of each other, Uh, you're going to hurt me, so there's not enough, so I start storing up stuff for me, I put bigger locks on my doors, Uh, you know, Cain kills Abel because there's not enough blessing. (laughs) Uh, And it ends in Egypt. And in Egypt... Some people get to rest. Hmm. Not everybody. Pharaoh probably gets to rest. Although it's notable that when Pharaoh's sleeping, he's having nightmares of scarcity. (laughs) Yeah. Nightmares of not enough. Yeah. And I guarantee you the enslaved uh, Hebrews don't get any rest. So Genesis begins in Eden, but it ends in Egypt. And so here's where I talk about Sabbath. Uh, This this, uh, talk tonight is about Sabbath and Jubilee. And here's what's really important, I think. The the Sabbath... uh, Keeping the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments, right? Arguably the one we acknowledge least of all. <laughs> I don't know. Agreed. Do yeah. not kill and take a day off. Just don't feel yeah. like equally <laughs> important for most people. But I would argue that the Sabbath command is the most important command in the list, and it is the central command. And what's really cool is um, there's two Ten Commandments, two lists of Ten Commandments mm-hmm. in the Bible, one in Exodus and one in Deuteronomy. And I think another problem is, the only time I've really studied the Ten Commandments growing up was Sunday school as a kid. Yeah. And the list of Ten Commandments in the Bible is actually really long. An eight-year-old is not going to be able to memorize it all, unless you simplify it into little tiny, do not kill, do not steal, keep the Sabbath, moving on, moving on. Mm-hmm. So not a lot of people have actually read the entire Sabbath command. It's pretty long. It's the longest one on the list. Mm-hmm. So let's imagine a generation or a few generations here in the West that's never read the full command. We accidentally start thinking that the Sabbath is about me taking a day off. Yeah. I need to rest from my work. So it's a rest from activity, maybe for some people, because I mean, if it's just a rest from activity, that's kind of like written into the Canadian law code. Like everybody gets, you don't need Jesus to take a day off and eat nachos and watch basketball. Mm-hmm. So some say, okay, well, then it's not just a day of rest from activity. It's a day of rest from the secular or from the profane. It's a day to go to church and read the Bible and focus on spiritual things. 
Um, so you're resting from activity or you're rest, resting from the secular. And I, I've, I've, I've heard that sermon uh, a million times. I've, I've read those books. If you actually read the Sabbath command, though, there's something bigger going on. There's a bigger vision. Mm. Uh, so in Exodus 20, the Sabbath command roots the whole Sabbath thing in that Garden of Eden memory. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So even God needs a nap once in a while. It's okay if you take one too. Mm -hmm. The end, go in peace. God's the creator, not you. Go in peace. What I really love though is the 10 commandments are listed again in the book of Deuteronomy. So this is Moses speaking now at the end of his life. And the, the list of Ten Commandments is the exact same in Deuteronomy, except the Sabbath command is different. Mm. Suspense, drum roll, are you ready? Maybe some people know it, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> this is what it says in Deuteronomy 5. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. As the Lord your God has commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. People think that's where it ends. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female slave, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that, here's the whole reason for Sabbath, so that your male and female slaves may rest as well as you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, therefore... The Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Yeah. So there's two Sabbath commands in the Bible, one rooted in Egypt and one as a divine reaction to, e one rooted in Eden and one as a divine reaction yeah. to Egypt. Yeah. You know, when God is the governor, there's rest. When Pharaoh's the governor, there's not. So in God's governance, we don't have slaves who do all the labor while only a few at the top get to rest. That's not how it works in God's system. So this command blows my mind because it's not being spoken to everyone. Because if you look around, there's a lot of people in our world who probably don't, couldn't even dream of the luxury of taking a day off to eat nachos and watch sports. They really can't. Um, so imagine if we saw this command as actually saying, hey, until everybody gets to rest, we can't call it Sabbath. God didn't stop until all the work was done. God didn't stop until everybody had, the whole system was set and there was shalom. Uh, we, we need to dismantle whatever systems are making it so that only some of us get that day or that month or that year. Um, God's people live in a way that's alternative to Pharaoh's way. Yeah. We are living as alternative people. So the law, the whole law, I would say, I just taught a course on the Pentateuch. The whole law in the Torah is about creating a society that lives in a way that's alternative to Pharaoh's society. You were in Egypt and that didn't go well for you. That was not a good time. I've rescued you from Egypt and now you're going to live in a way to make sure you don't either end back up in Egypt or accidentally become Pharaohs yourselves. We don't believe that God had blessed Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. So why, if we become Pharaoh, should we believe God has blessed us? Which, and I know it's, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. challenging subject, but I think that's what the Sabbath is about. And one reason I know that is because not only in the Old Testament law is there a Sabbath day. So this is wild. You think you're a landowner and you are wealthy enough that you have uh, slaves, uh, enslaved people. Mm -hmm. You have uh, sons and daughters, which was a symbol of wealth in the ancient world. And you are wealthy enough and you have enough uh, stuff that... Um, foreigners and refugees and people who are vulnerable come to you for help. Hmm. So in this ancient society, they don't have like, uh, like social uh, resources that we do today. So, so you're, you're vulnerable, you're fleeing war, uh, you're, some horrible things happened in your life and you're desperate, you know which landowners to go to. And so the Sabbath day is where you stop, you the, so this command is being spoken to those wealthy landowners but you go out in the field and you make sure every single person gets to sit mm. at your table with you. It's crazy. You got to make That's a big awesome. plate of nachos. And at that table, can you, I, I don't know if I feel like if I was an employee of a really oppressive and like cruel boss and he invited me to my house, his house for dinner, 
I wouldn't feel at ease. Yeah. Am I in trouble? Did I do something wrong? So, so the vision isn't you have to go for dinner at your boss's house once a week. The vision is this table where for that one day, the king and the slave girl equal. Like, that's radical. That's crazy. That vision alone would dismantle all of the systems of Pharaoh in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that means that the king has to be brought down to look with respect and dignity. And the slave girl has to be lifted up. Mm -hmm. Bringing down the mighty and lifting up, that, that's all over the Bible. We just celebrated that at Christmas a yeah. few weeks ago. Yeah. And that's what Sabbath does. And then what's even wilder, and this has not really been kept, every seventh year is called the sabbatical year or the Sabbath year, wherein you uh, release enslaved people, yeah. forgive their debt, and you don't sow any seeds in your field. So the land gets to rest as well as you. That's a whole thing. Um, like, like, like that dismantles some pretty powerful systems. That slows down some systems that when they start going, they are impossible to stop. So every seven years, we forgive debts. We let the land rest. Uh, the, the oxen don't, get, don't have to plow this year. They get to rest too. And then what's even wilder is that every seventh Sabbath year, so every, this, this Sabbath of Sabbaths, every 50th year is called the year of Jubilee. And I love this vision so much because it's the ultimate Sabbath year. So this is what, you know, when I hear people say, Sabbath is about taking a day off from work. Like that does not make any sense at all when you read the Sabbath year laws and the Jubilee. That's Pharaoh's Sabbath. Um, the year of Jubilee, so enslaved people go free, debts are forgiven. And then let's say in the last 50 years, you went through a time of poverty. Maybe a, a, a family member died. Maybe a, your house burned down, a disaster. Like it's not your fault, something happened. That trauma, that crisis, will most likely work its way through the next three, four, five generations. Mm -hmm. the, the year of Jubilee limits that. So let's say you go through a time of um, poverty and you have to sell. You have to sell your grandmother's ring to put food on the table. You have to sell uh, this thing that has been in your family for years. Now every 50 years, uh, someone shows up at your door. Here's your grandmother's ring back. Here's your land back. Here's all that stuff you lost back. Wow. You, and when we say like forgives your debts, I mean like, and even when I say this to people, often their shoulders relax and they get a little glimpse of the Sabbath rest I'm talking mm -hmm. about. See, so imagine the bank calls you tonight and says, hey, your mortgage, we forgive you. Paid off. Your student loans, we forgive you. Your visa, we forgive you. Every seven years. So in Pharaoh's system, there's um, intergenerational wealth yeah. and intergenerational yeah. poverty. And I know there's a lot of cities, even in Calgary right now, no one's living in them. Foreclosure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. bankruptcy. That's Pharaoh's system. That, that, that's how it thrives. But in God's system, there's no such thing as intergenerational wealth or intergenerational poverty. Because I might become really, really wealthy at your misfortune, yeah. but every 50 mm -hmm. years, so my children couldn't just inherit all of that that I got from you. They give it back to your children. And then we both have a seat at the table. Yeah. And that's God's governance. Mm -hmm. That's God's vision. So I was raised um, to believe that Sabbath is just about me, me taking a day off. I had never seen it as an invitation to live alternatively. I had never seen it as an invitation to work towards making this world a home like God did. <laughs> um, not just a home for me, but a home for my neighborhood, a home for my neighbors. Jesus takes it a bit further and says, even a home for your enemies, <laughs> which is wild. Yeah. Um, Sabbath is a command for more than just the privileged folks who are able to take a day off. Sabbath is about making sure everybody has a place of belonging. Mm. And so it's not just me and Jesus feeling at ease with each other at our table for two. It's about my neighborhood where I live becoming a home for Jesus. And for all who are looking for home, to find a home there with Jesus. So I will ask you, Rick, because mm -hmm. you're the New Testament um, specialist. Have you ever noticed how much trouble Jesus gets into on the Sabbath day? Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And in a certain way, as you kind of paint the background and drop a canvas so we can understand Jesus, uh, we see that almost 
everything that he's doing, both in his life, his teaching, his ministry, certainly through his death and resurrection and, and, and uh, inviting us in, is really uh, a release of uh, liberation of life in, in the Sabbath living in, yeah. in, in so many ways that we could see that. But specifically what you said, we find much of Jesus' ministry uh, locating itself in the Sabbath yeah. itself on that day of the week. Uh, and so we're going to, or let me at least try to spend just a couple of minutes talking about Jesus. And I'm going to just use the Gospel of Mark. Okay. Um, uh, Mark 1 gives us a real good snapshot of a few things that, that are happening. We hear right from the outset in Mark 1, this is the beginning of the good news. There is something that's come before. In one way, one of the threads we're picking up from the Eden memory is this long narrative uh, that now he's announcing. It's the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And then by verse 15, Jesus is on the scene bursting forth this idea of there's something more. The kingdom of God is here. Mm -hmm. By the end of the chapter, we get, there's a number of little vignettes and pieces that are, that are there. But by the end of the chapter, we find in Mark 1 verse 40, uh, this little uh, healing narrative where Jesus uh, not only heals the leper, but he tells the leper himself, listen, don't tell anyone, go immediately to the temple, offer your sacrifices there. And, you know, we see a central part of that uh, text there, that, that passage, is this idea that uh, Jesus is the healer, Jesus is God, he has the power uh, to, to heal. But there's this also sense that Jesus is releasing him as you've kind of set the stage, reminding us in Deuteronomy 5 and the, and, uh, and the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, what's being taught there, he's releasing him back into community as he would offer be mm -hmm. cleansed. And so it's a it's a beginning of a kind of a little snapshot that, that's happening there. We jump into the next chapter. We see after Jesus uh, jumps in to um, uh, invite Levi to follow him, he invites Levi to a table. And immediately he's sitting, and there's this tension right away there in the text. There's tension that's kind of already been mm -hmm. arising since the first chapter. But there's this tension with those who are watching the Pharisees, and they're calling out, Jesus, why are you sitting with Pharisees? Or why are you sitting with tax collectors and sinners? A label mm -hmm. kind of on a certain type of people, mm -hmm. demeaning them in so many ways. And... Uh, um, and, and kind of calling Jesus out for that. And, and Jesus' words, many of us kind of familiar with more of Jesus' words than maybe the Old Testament. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick I've come to call the righteous, not sinners. Mm -hmm. In one sense, there's this picture that you've kind of created and, and set the stage from the Hebrew scriptures where we, we see Jesus at that one table mm -hmm. with those who thought that they were left out that they were on the other side of, uh, um, uh, of power, that they were kind of the ones who were pushed away and not mm -hmm. in control mm -hmm. of that which was. And so Jesus is saying, no, the kingdom is here. This is the way it's going to begin to look. Mm -hmm. So that's just two chapters in Mark's gospel. By the time we kind of move forward a little bit further in the second chapter, we have this kind of Sabbath narrative. Disciples are picking grain uh, from the fields. The Pharisees say they can't do that. There's there's Torah. There's mm -hmm. there's the law of the Moses day. that says that's not going to happen. And uh, why are your disciples doing this? And, uh, and Jesus kind of says, listen, the Sabbath was made for people. Um, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But the Sabbath is is for people to to be human people to be released, that, that this day is not a day of restriction, or like you kind of reminded us at the beginning of just rest, but this is a day of liberation where it's here in bounty for us to take, to yeah. have, to receive yeah. from God in his governance as, uh, as you had kind of indicated yeah. and reminded yeah. us. So it's beautiful uh, to begin to see in just one gospel, this narrative, uh, it's certainly about Jesus Christ and yeah. who he is as the Messiah and the Son yeah. of God. But it's this idea of, of what it means when he comes into the world. Again, I grew up with that same kind of idea that you did. I thought it was just like me and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And yet it's inviting me to see uh, through a different kind of a lens of what flourishing is. It's belonging. It's this sense of we are together with others 
uh, at the table and uh, there's more than enough for us to share. Mm -hmm. We could go one more chapter if you, if you let me in because <laughs> I think it's, it's significant and you typically would see this when people walk through uh, the Gospel of Mark. They land in the third chapter and there's this a short little kind of vignette, this, this piece where, where people are noticing that Jesus' mother and brothers are there and, uh, and they're around Jesus as, as he's teaching. And then Jesus, it's like, kind of almost ignores the comment and acknowledges that there's a new community or his words as he looks out. He says, these people around me, these are the ones who are my brothers, my sisters, my mother. They're the ones who, who yeah. walk in obedience. New but kinship. the indication is kinship and I'm doing something else here and it's beyond what you even see. Yeah. And if it's not really, uh, you know, we don't have the time to kind of weave another thread through Mark's gospel, but there's <laughs> always this, those who understand Jesus' message in Mark's gospel and, and those who don't. And, and so many kind of might miss the reality of what Jesus is doing, saying there's this vision that we're reclaiming mm -hmm. uh, from the Eden memory that uh, we're pulling back. And I love that image that you started us with to the one table. Yeah. And there is only one table. It's yeah. not my table over here and your table there, like you said. It's just this table and it's a it's a family, it's a belonging table. That's right. And it's a place where, um, just such, such rich words, but it's a place where we can be at ease mm -hmm. because we are seen, we are known, there's enough. Yeah. We are here to be ourselves and, and, and there's, a, there's a sense of freedom there. Yeah. And, and that might come uh, maybe a little bit, if we play that out into the second half of the New Testament a little bit, you know, we know, I know you, you've done a lot of work in, in Acts, uh, but we know that by Acts 2 and the Spirit being poured out, mm -hmm. now we mm -hmm. see the church moving out partway through Acts into the Gentile world. Yeah. And in my imagination, I see again and again as I read and reread through the New Testament and the letters that are there, the epistles, um, that these little communities, it, it's not, I'm, I'm not just reading uh, propositional statements. I'm not just how to live, yeah. how I can be a better person. Uh, it's, it's written to context of people who, who are in situations and almost like new kingdom outposts, you know? Yeah. They're out there trying to figure it out in real time in a world, in a Gentile world that's mm -hmm. foreign, that's different. And uh, there's the Jews and there's the Gentiles coming together now in Christ. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of, there's the reality of the first century of status and honor and shame, that's yeah. tensions that are there. There's some who have, uh, certainly in power, Rome who has, and then so many who don't have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in those contexts, um, maybe, uh, at least in my imagination, maybe one of the most exciting epistles to read is is the one that has 25 verses, uh, Paul's letter uh, to Philemon, the slave owner. And right, uh, yeah. I find that just uh, engaging on this sense. Many of our audience will know, um, recognize, slavery was a fairly big deal, yep. and all the way through the biblical narrative. Yep. Um, but certainly by the time you came to the Roman Empire, some have said that the engine that drove the economy was the slave trade itself. And a slave, um, I think <laughs> scholars have noted that upwards it's possible that 250,000 people were traded in the city of Rome uh, every year. It, it, it's, it's if someone was a head of a household like Philemon, and I'll get to that in a, in a moment, uh, there's a sense that uh, they owned slaves. They had their family, they had, they had a wife. Uh, those were the legitimate heirs to all the inheritance that would be there. And, um, and the slaves were like, like any other piece of property. Yep. No status, no citizenship in yep. Rome. No, they, they knew it. They, they were born, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. while well, some of them were conquered, some of them were, were born into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, they were like a shovel. Yeah. They were like a, a, an animal that was owned. Yeah, they weren't eating at the same table. That's so, so true. They at best got what was there. If, if they were allowed by the head of the household to marry um, in that kind of, that greater kind of compound, uh, the children were at the discretion of the uh, of the head of the household mm -hmm. again to to sell to do whatever and so in so many ways um they understood the reality so then in 
likely this house church Mm -hmm. where Philemon is very likely at least hosting, Mm -hmm. could be anywhere from 15 to 20, maybe 25 people, people who are both Gentiles, possibly some Jews, likely in in Colossae, we understand. Mm -hmm. Paul addresses a letter directly to Philemon about his runaway slave Onesimus. Mm -hmm. And everyone would know in that household even the slaves who were uh, in the background watching, maybe some of them mm-hmm. had already just begun to participate in, uh, in the celebration on the first day of the week mm-hmm. of this new body of Christ. But they, they were all aware of what's going on. Onesimus had run away. And the fact was that in Roman law, Philemon had every right to do whatever he wanted to Onesimus. Yes. Uh, beat him throw him away, beat a man, throw him away, uh, sell him. Uh, He was a piece of property in a certain way. And Onesimus had run away. We aren't exactly sure. He'd run away to Paul along the way he comes to Christ. Uh, And Paul Paul is brilliant in his tact Mm -hmm. in speaking and writing this letter. For as he approaches Philemon in the letter, maybe I should just say this. We have a pretty solid understanding that many of these letters, when they first came and were, and were brought to, to each house church, mm-hmm. they were likely read. Yeah. Uh, and they're read in real time in that community. So we need to have this kind of imaginative kind of idea that everyone was there as the letter carrier is mm-hmm. in the room and mm-hmm. they're gathered. And they're all wondering what's going to happen to Onesimus, who's also there, as the letter's being read. And they're yeah. hearing the Apostle Paul kind of, you know, their spiritual father mm. in many ways read. Mm. Through and the mouth of Onesimus. Yeah, oh, exactly. Crazy. Wow. Three verses kind of really strike me right in the middle. Paul says this, Perhaps the reason that he, Onesimus, was separated from you for a little while is that you might take him back forever. <laughs> um, no longer as a slave, Paul says, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. You know, if Onesimus would have been a woman as a, as a sister in Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of the beginning of, of uh, seeing what a church has to do, a community now being formed in mm-hmm. Christ at mm-hmm. that table. What they need to begin to struggle, uh, struggle and, and work out in reconciliation. So what Paul is saying is Onesimus has a place. Yeah. He belongs. And it, it's not about, uh, listen, uh, you, you have the right and there, there's, a, there's another law, this law of Christ, this law of love, this law of belonging yeah. that we're talking about today that you need to understand and see Philemon as you welcome him, in a sense, back I- into family. Paul goes on to say, he's a dear brother to me, but he's even dear to you as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Again, yeah. enhancing yeah. the reality that there's something that has redefined the reality of how we look yeah. across the table to one another. And, uh-huh. and uh, for me, it, it's, it's amazing language. Yeah. The, final, the final verse, verse 17 in that short letter is this. So if you consider me a partner, um, welcome him as you would welcome me or accept him. But the word welcome, it's the same word we find in, in Romans, Romans 15. It's again, it's such a beautiful picture of um, what it means to come to sit at yeah. the table and make yeah. space for another. Yeah, like... For Onesimus, this used to be his a place of his oppression. Yeah. Philemon, I want you to make it a home. Mm-hmm. Invite him home. Yeah. He, let him be safe here. Yeah. Let him be at ease. At ease. Let him come to rest yeah. at your table. Yeah. Provide Sabbath. Yeah. And it, it that that idea is revolutionary, especially in the to- Roman world. Totally. Well, and. Isn't it? It's revolutionary today. <laughs> yeah. And, so. and in certain ways, it should press kind of into me and challenge me. Yeah. But in certain ways, it's the beauty of, you know, the gospel, yeah. this idea of, of flourishing that really is recapturing mm-hmm. the vision mm-hmm. of, of Eden that was there uh, all, all along. It's, oh it's uh, I'll just say this and, uh, and I'll turn it back to you. Um, but there's this idea that, you know, we think about the way we live in this world. And again, so many of us, even instinctually, we've grown up into faith communities mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. we really do think it's about me or yeah. maybe at the most me and my family. And once in a while, we do something out of kindness. Or yeah. Once in a while, we love our neighbor. 
as you mm. kind of highlight, maybe not my enemy. They're, yeah. You know, they cheer for the wrong team or their, their food smells differently than my, you know, it's, it's, a, it's hard for me to kind of engage at that mm. level. Mm. But what the gospel does is we see the, the beauty of what's being fleshed out and what, the, what, what we're being called to in mm -hmm. Christ is the gospel calls us to live or be in the world in a different way. Yeah. To sit at that table and recognize that Christ as the host. So it's even amazing that, you know, one of the central symbols of the church is a body that's been broken for us, the bread, the Eucharist, mm -hmm. uh, some would call it communion, and it's meant to be a part of our every gathering, this yeah. symbol of Sabbath sharing yeah. in our life together. I'll leave it at that, and I, I want to no, hear it. I, I'm blown away at how you're exactly right. Philemon is a book about Sabbath. It's yeah. like, because no doubt Philemon can take a day off. He could take a week off. He's probably got a, a vacation home. <laughs> yeah, On, yeah, Onesimus. I'm sure, yeah. Ha, well, not a chance. Yeah. So it's like, Philemon, until Onesimus is there with you at your at your table as your brother, don't call it Sabbath. It's an important thing. Like obviously, people need rest and, and self care. That's really important. But yeah. the vision of Sabbath is much bigger than us here in the West have even begun to imagine it. So I think, who are the people in my neighborhood who couldn't dream of? Who who, who don't feel at ease in the world? That they're working three jobs, maybe they got chronic pain, maybe they, they got family back in another country that they're longing to bring over. Yeah. They can't rest, they can't rest. And I, I'm over here thinking, oh, look, you know, look at me, I'm a good Christian, I, I got my day off. Um, but the, the real division here is, hey, go knock on that family's door and figure out what it would take so that they could have the rest you have and they could sit at your table as one of your siblings. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, um, I'm still processing how profound this is, but the book of Revelation. Um, so sometimes um, when I talk about this with people, they're like, we'll get that in heaven. Yeah, yeah. After we I've die. I've heard that in my whole life too. Like, yeah. you know, just be good yeah, now and that God will work that out up there. Like, and I'm like, well, we got to read Revelation again as a church because in Revelation 21, it's not, then finally everybody was up in the heaven at this table. Um, Revelation ends, in Revelation 21 it says, I saw the holy city. There's probably the big restaurant there. <laughs> the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, being us, the earth down here. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, and the word in, in Greek, it's literally, look, God's home is now among the people. God's coming here to be at home here with us. It wasn't an escape plan. We got to get up and go there and be at home with God. That's my true home. No, God's true home is here among us. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? That's, that's a big deal. I, I, I could sit there probably for a few days in silence that God's longing for home to feel at ease like back on that seventh day. And, and it says, look, God's home is now among the people. He, and now he will, some translations say dwell, um, but dwell and rest, same word. Now hmm. God is at rest with them. They will be his people and God himself will be Good. with them and be their God. And then the best, verse 4 of Revelation 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And recall that the whole um, liberation from slavery, the house of slavery in Exodus began because God speaks to Moses and says, I've heard their crying. I've seen their suffering. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And here God's like there. I'd... Until every single person is here and there's no more crying and there's no more suffering and there's no more oppression, we can't, we can't start the party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Behold, God's home is now among humans. There's no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things has passed away. Horse and rider, he's thrown into the sea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So think of what what Philemon's household was like pre Paul's letter and post all things were made new in that house Onesimus is a slave that's now a brother at the table um, and I love there's that line in Philemon obviously that you know um, I don't remember which exact verse but where Paul says and if he owes you anything charge it to my account yeah yeah like can you imagine that's what it means for me to be a Christian in my neighborhood if he owes you money and that's why you guys I'll can't be friends it. yeah charge it to my account yeah Oh, charge it to my account. Charge my God's like charge it to my account. 
whatever debt you have put this guy in, and that's why you can't be his neighbor, charge it to my account and invite him over. Mm -hmm. It's settled. Mm -hmm. That's a new order. Yeah. That's behold, I make all things new. Yeah. That whole family system would have changed with that revolutionary act yeah. of inviting them to be at your table as a brother. So imagine the world, imagine the neighborhood where you live as God's home and everybody in that neighborhood being at home, at ease, yeah. in a state of rest. That's, that's the biblical vision of Sabbath, where there's belonging. Yeah. That gives us a lot of hope, and that's kind of how we want to end this, mm -hmm. too. Like, mm -hmm. it gives the church hope, and, mm -hmm. and that's what we want to lean into. We, you know, we aren't, as I, as I, as I hear us dialogue and kind of, we aren't, we aren't saying that God doesn't transform me or that I don't have a response to the, to the grace of God. Right. But we're saying it's so much more. Yeah. And it's and it's been there. It's it's throughout Scripture. It's it's actually at the very center of of this invitation. And so the church today has a tremendous amount of hope yeah. uh, as we live out a much richer, fuller vision of belonging yeah, that's in, right. in the world and inviting others to the table as we continue to to say, I I love it. Uh, I know. Mm -hmm. um, in your church, in your community here in, in the city of Calgary, you do some unique things and you try to work, work it out. Can you talk, tell, say a little bit about that? Uh, so, yeah, I, mean, I feel a little embarrassed doing that because we're a very small church uh, in COVID <laughs> and by no means are we getting everything right. But um, one idea that a few community members we had this year was to build a shelter on our property for a fridge and a deep freeze and a pantry that would just be full of food 24-7 sure. for anybody who needs it. Yeah. And there was no, like, come to church. There's no, like, you don't have to sign up. You don't have to prove that you need it. You could pull up in a Beamer and go take some milk from the fridge, and there's no one there to judge you. Yeah. There's no stigma attached to having yeah. a hard time this month, whatever. And we just had this suspicion that the whole neighborhood would get on board and keep it full. Yeah. And it's emptying out every three hours right now. Uh, about 50% of the people who are coming to use, from what we can tell, we, we don't really watch it, but when I'm having meetings and hanging out, huh. um, people, they're seniors, which is pretty wild. The people that fed us don't have enough food. Come on. Are coming. That's not, we're not, the thing we're doing, that's not Sabbath until those seniors have enough food. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Um, this is huge. Yeah. yeah. We, so we've just tried to be creative in, in a few of these systems of like, hey, what if we could meet the world's narrative of scarcity with a narrative of abundance? Because hmm. one thing I've seen in COVID is this incredible fear in all of us. Um, and, and one of the big fears is that there's not enough. It's fear. Like, I mean, yeah, this didn't happen in 2020. We see it in but, our students, don't we? Yeah. 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 And, and others around. Yeah, I'm with you. This yeah. fear that there's not enough. We're, we're, we're stuck in this narrative of scarcity. And when you're stuck in a narrative of scarcity, like Pharaoh had a narrative of scarcity, you're going to have to store up and you're going to need a big lock yeah. <laughs> to protect what you've stored up from all those strangers out there. Mm. And you're going to put all your energy into building up that savings, that, that storehouse, and protecting it. You're not going to have any extra anything to work towards flourishing in the neighborhood. Um, how can you love your neighbor if you're scared of your neighbor? It's impossible. Um, and so I think that um, we need churches <clears throat> who are willing to confront the narrative of scarcity until the narrative of abundance is what begins to shape our imagination. So a narrative of abundance, this trust that there's enough, like in the Garden of Eden, there's enough. That narrative of abundance is going to lead me to actually open my door, build a bigger table, hmm. share, <laughs> see generosity as uh, the gift. And as you mentioned before, the communion table, that's all, that's all God, God's doing is meeting our scarcity narrative. Take and eat. Mm -hmm. All of me for you. Take, you don't need money. Come, you're hungry? Take, take, take. And I, I go to communion and I take the little tiny crumb off the bread because, you know, I don't want to be selfish. And I'm like, yeah. keep coming back until you can rip off a big fistful and trust that there's enough. And you're not being selfish. You're not taking up too much mm -hmm. space. You belong here. Take as much as you need. Yeah. Take. You don't need money. This is my body for you, says Jesus. There's enough. There's enough. Um, so this little community fridge that uh, we, we have out there on the property, I see it as an attempt to confront the scarcity narrative. Um, and, and real quick, I, I know I really am excited about some questions that people probably have yeah, here. But yeah. um, when we first put up this fridge, 
uh, we, we got, you know, some gift cards and people in the church are excited to go spend a bit of money at Safeway and fill up the fridge. It doesn't take much to put a bunch of milk and yogurt and fresh fruit in there yeah. and fill it up. An hour later, it's gone. It's empty. And I remember one night, so I had bought maybe like 20 like frozen pizzas. They're like $3 each. This was not a big deal. And I just filled the deep freezer, frozen pizzas, some frozen pierogies. Like it was just, just fill it up. And then I had a meeting in the church for an hour and I went outside and it was empty. I'm like, I know for a fact that 30 people didn't come and each take their little pizza. <laughs> Someone rolled up and took it all. Yeah. And then we know it for the first few weeks. Um, anytime we came, I'm like, it's like, is someone standing around the corner watching for when it gets filled and then they just come take it all? And I, I noticed something in me. I got really frustrated and angry. Huh. It's like, what are you, we're trying to do this nice thing for them. Who keeps taking all the pizza? Just take what you need. And someone was like, we should put a sign on the fridge that says, please only take what you need. I thought, wait a minute, if you've lived your whole life and there wasn't enough food and there's 20 free pizzas right there, you bet your bottom exactly. dollar that person's going to come take all of it. Mm -hmm. So what do we have to do as a church? Put a sign that says, no, only one pizza per person. Or do we commit to keep filling that freezer with pizzas until that person's able to relax and trust that there's going to be pizza there next time mm -hmm. so that they can afford to just take what they need? So we actually have to outrun their narrative of scarcity and just keep filling that with pizza. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, our work, our act of resistance in the neighborhood is yeah. to be more generous and, and, and show that there's enough. And so I think that what Jesus is doing is joining my neighbor and me together at the same table where Jesus is giving away more than he keeps. Mm -hmm. And at that table, he's saying, go and do likewise. <laughs> Do this every time you gather. Yeah, yeah. Give away more than you keep. That's good. And, and it's a, our, we need a bigger imagination. Yeah. And, and I'm excited for that. So that's a, a Sabbath and Jubilee talk, a Theology of Belonging. That's good. Well, thank you. Um, we've just got a couple of questions right now that are in the Q&A uh, that I will start off with here. And the first one comes from a good friend out in the East asking the question of, in what ways has the move from Sabbath to the first day of the week impacted our understanding of Sabbath? Hmm. Whichever one of you would like to tackle that. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so you, you, you might have a better answer than this. But he, what I will say is that I don't know if in my imagination it has switched to the first day of the week. I think we all think Monday's the first day of the week. Hmm. We've just moved it. Mm -hmm. I, at the end of my hard week, I get two days off, and then my week starts on Monday. Yeah. And, and so I actually think, even, even if we said, well, now the Monday's the Sabbath, then we would think the week begins on Tuesday. Yeah, I think growing up, to me, at, I'm probably quite a bit older than you, Nikki. <laughs> uh, and so when I think of the, the world that I grew up in, the prairies in Canada, kind of conservative evangelical world, Sabbath was just Old Testament language. So yeah. in a way, I, re I can resonate with that question because thinking of Sunday, or maybe I learned by the end of high school, it was the first day of the week. To me, it just sounded, so then I, I just felt, unfortunately, I felt like everything in the Old Testament, most of that didn't make sense. We didn't have to do that. So I think that's how, for me anyways, there was a separation yeah. of understanding mm -hmm. uh, and what I thought and what I realized was, mm -hmm. uh, so I would have missed so much of what, you yeah. drew out of the, you know, I would have kind of rolled over Deuteronomy 5 and, yeah. and the longer version of, of that. that. That might yeah. be my reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, we have another question here, and it asks, uh, why does it seem like the biblical authors, especially the prophets, connected neglecting Sabbath with a propensity to worship other gods? Hmm. Oh, oh, I would love to talk about that. I think um, in the 8th century prophets, so... Uh, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Amos, you get this theme of God's like, I reject your Sabbath. I reject your sacred assemblies. I reject your festivals. I don't want your sacrifices. I want mercy. You're like, that's Micah. I don't want that. Like that individualistic, like you, you got all the Philemons in town going, going to synagogue <laughs> on Sabbath. Look how righteous I am. And God's like, Onesimus is working the field right now. What yeah, are you doing? Yeah. Don't call, this isn't worship. Yeah. Like, I've had a hard time kind of thinking about, like, me uh, at a big worship service. You know, I got, like, an $8 cup of coffee in my hand. I'm sure these beans were harvested by slaves. And I'm like, yes, Lord. <laughs> and that sounds kind of harsh. I don't know. Maybe I'm being my youth leader self here. Sorry. <laughs> That's good. Um, but the, 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 the prophets are like, no, this is not the, 
the fast I have desired. This is in Isaiah 58. It's this long, beautiful passage. This is not the fast I have mm. desired. The fast I've desired is for you to go and feed the hungry, loose the chains of, of injustice. And actually in that text in Isaiah 58, it comes to this beautiful conclusion. If you keep my Sabbaths and call my day a delight, because that's what it means. Um, so maybe I got a little off track of that question, but I think the idea that if your religion is just about you and your own good and securing what you need for your own fulfillment, I think the Old Testament prophets would call that idolatry. Well, the, the same uh, individual asked, um, outrunning people's narrative of uh, sacrity. I wonder, oh, scarcity, sorry. Yeah. I wonder if Nicola can expound on that. Yeah, that's good. Sure. Um, I think, uh, well, well, the Old Testament scholar in me just wants to go back to Exodus where there's this famine in the land, and so we have to store up and be prepared for it, and we know that there's only going to be a limited supply, so we can't waste any of it. Uh, there, there's only so much, and, and so then somehow, though, there's enough that the Pharaoh can have palaces <laughs> and uh, these kind of extravagant building projects. And, and I think, you know, when you first um, go into the book of Exodus, um, the, he the enslaved Hebrews are building storehouses and shelters for excess. Mm -hmm. So how did we get here? Why are we using slavery to build storage for our excess? If there's excess, why do we have slavery? But there's an anxiety that we don't have enough for everyone, and so we need to protect it. And, and, and so there's this, like, I don't know, when, when COVID hit back in 2020, I, it was really hard to find toilet paper in the city because there was this mm, t fear that there wasn't going to be enough. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to get as much as I possibly can, and like, haha, I got there first. I beat you. Too bad. Early bird gets the worm. And I'm like, excuse me very much. I am a Christian. If you run out of toilet paper, you come knock come on my on. door. <laughs> Yeah. I will share my last role with yeah. you. Yeah. I will love you as I love myself. And in that, we're trusting that we're going to have an... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find That's toilet today, paper. we have enough, and we'll keep yeah. finding... God will provide. In yeah, a, God will provide. <laughs> like, Well, a sense of like, I don't need to um, anxiously store up and then put locks on my door and yeah. be like, yeah. too bad for you. Yeah. That, that, that's this script. So I don't know if that answers it. I think so. City, but I hope so. I think that... Uh, wraps up all the questions that we have right now in our q and I just want to say thank you. Tonight has been um, so informative, so inspiring, um, and I know that our listeners that are watching across Canada, the chats that are coming through and thanking you, and um, let me just say, uh, we are privileged at Ambrose to have theologians and scholars that are working with our students um, I jokingly said to them at the beginning of this, and I don't normally do this at our public lectures, but as a parent of students here at Ambrose, I have heard Nikayla's name more than once, and it was a privilege to finally meet her tonight because of the impact that she's having in our classrooms. And um, I can see why after listening to both of you tonight. It's been a great night. So thank you so much. Uh, for those of you uh, that are still with us um, online right now, just know that you will be receiving an email in the next couple of days, probably by end of day Monday, that feel free to share this lecture out to anybody that you think could also, would also enjoy hearing it. And I will be adding into the chat uh, an opportunity for you to register for our third public lecture, which is taking place on Thursday, February 24th at 7 or 6.30 p.m., sorry, Mountain Time. Mark Buchanan is going to be with us that evening, and he is going to be talking on, I will become even more undignified than this the perils and delights of novelizing the David story. And I know you will not want to miss that one as well. But anyways, until we can gather together in person, I'm thrilled that we have this technology and this opportunity. So thank you all for tuning in and good night from Ambrose University. <laughs>